Hello and good evening. Uh, my name is Joan Concannon. I'm Director of External Relations here at the University of York and I'm also very happily uh, Director of York Festival of Ideas. It's not often that one of your colleagues comes sidling up to you at an event and says, did you know I live six crofts down from Ian Blackford? <laughs> to which the answer is, I didn't, and what would you like me to do about that? Well, it turns out the thing he would like me to do is get Ian Blackford to come to the Festival of Ideas, and we were very successful in doing that. But... I won't say any more about Ian, um, because Gavin Esler, who is a regular uh, York Festival of Ideas contributor, which we're very grateful for, is going to introduce him properly as he converses with him. So, quick word about Gavin, for anyone who doesn't know, there can't be anyone who doesn't know Gavin. Uh, Award-winning broadcaster and podcaster, journalist and writer, he's the holder of a Royal Television Society Award, a Sony Gold Radio Award, two Lovey Awards... <laughs> for his podcast series about Vladimir Putin, The Big Steel. He's the author of five novels, uh, Loyalties, Deep Blue, The Blood Brother, A Scandalous Man and Power Play, and four non-fiction books, The United States of Anger, Lessons from the Top, Brexit Without the Bullshit, and How Britain Ends. And for anyone who's interested and hasn't read How Britain Ends, it's absolutely brilliant. I know this because I interviewed him earlier this year about it. He will be very happily selling and signing books over in the Ronco Cobb afterwards. So, without further ado, I am going to ask Gavin and Ian to take to the floor, and I'm sure we'll have a very informative and lively chat about the state of politics. Thank you all very much for coming. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Joan, for those, those very, very kind words. Um, a very warm welcome to this Festival of I Ideas event, and a uh, big thanks to Joan and the entire team for organising these events, which I think are absolutely terrific. Um, tonight, we're going to tackle what is essentially the future of our country. And by our country, I mean as currently defined the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. We all know that this ancient union has come under real stresses and strains in recent years, particularly since Brexit. Northern Ireland and Scotland voted to remain. Uh, England and Wales voted to leave. In Scotland in particular, it might be something we'll touch on in a moment, people were told in 2014 during the independence uh, debate and the independence referendum that the only way to stay in the EU is to stay in the United Kingdom. And I've talked to voters in Scotland who say we were really misled on that because exactly the opposite has happened. Um, so, where are we now? The title of what follows is Reimagining Scottish-English Relations Post-Brexit. Our distinguished speaker is Ian Blackford, the Scottish National Party MP for Ross, Sky and for Harbour, former leader at Westminster of the SNP, and I have to say I'm, I'm biased in this, but I think he represents one of the most beautiful constituencies anywhere. One, one of, one of it is the most <laughs> beautiful constituency, Gavin. Go on. <laughs> I'm sure Peter will, Peter will testify to that. There he is. <laughs> and when we were preparing for this, I phoned him and he, he said he was, he, he was a bit distracted because he was watching his wife bring the sheep in. Yeah. <laughs> That's true, isn't it? It was true. Yeah. Uh, um, we'll get on to the topic first, but there's, I, I, there's two things I've got to ask you before, uh, before we get on to that. One is... Uh, it's not a question, but really, but Boris Johnson. I mean, what is going on in Parliament and what is going to happen in the well, next he's, day? He's still so. dominating the landscape, isn't he? That's, that's, that's one of the things. He's, he's, he's gone as a, as a Member of Parliament. I, I have to say, with everything that we've witnessed over the last few years, I'm just relieved he's gone. And I hope that the Conservative Party recognise that this man, quite simply, is not fit for purpose. He should never, ever, ever be allowed back into public office. He's demeaned the office of uh, Prime Minister that he, that he had. You know, I'll, obviously as someone that represented the SNP, I would have differences with any Conservative Prime Minister, let me be honest about that. But if I, if I take someone like Theresa May, um, at least I could respect the way that she conducted herself. Um, she's someone that understood the office, the importance and the integrity of the office that she held. And she was respectful to the other opposition party leaders. So when you think about some of the things we've gone through, think about Salisbury, Scrippo, um, I think obviously now that we're going through Ukraine. And, and, and let me characterise these things in, in, in the following way. With Theresa, she would make sure that opposition party leaders were given national security briefings. You wanted to stand together. But enab to enable you to do that, you needed to have the information. With Boris Johnson, that wasn't possible. And in all the years that he was Prime Minister, I had one meeting 
in number 10 down the street, just one. And I'm really grateful that Ben Wallace has actually done a remarkable job as Defence Secretary, and he's made sure that myself and Keir Starmer were getting briefings f from the National Security Advisor or officials in, in the MOD on a bi-weekly basis. So again, we could stand together. And Boris Johnson treated everybody as the, I hate to say it, as the enemy. And that could be people in his own party, it could be opposition politicians, it could be the devolved administrations, the, the Crown dependencies, the overseas territories. It didn't matter. It was always about him. And that office was always about him and that sense of entitlement that he, that he had. Thank goodness he's gone. Now, the, the other area, and as I say, we'll get on, and also the question of standing together and what, what that might mean in the future, I'd like to talk about because I think it would be yeah. great interest here. But Nicola Sturgeon, uh, when I heard that the First Minister of Scotland had been, quote, arrested, mm. I was really shocked by that, actually, because that, uh, maybe you could explain, we can't get into details about the case because neither of us really know what's going on, but would you, could you explain a bit about um, what you think is going on? <coughs> yes, of course, and I have to be very careful because of the contempt of yeah. court uh, proceedings, so you're not, in, you're, you're not allowed to discuss the, these live events, but in essence, the, the process of being arrested is part of the criminal justice regime in Scotland, that if anyone is going to be brought in for question, that they are arrested at that point. And, and of course, with Nicola, and it's true with, uh, with Peter Murrow and with Colin Beattie as well, in, in, in all of these cases, that they have, been, uh, they have been arrested but not charged. And all that we know is that the police investigation continues, and all of us, I think, have a duty to support the police in their efforts. They should be allowed to get on with the job of the investigation that they're engaged in uh, but I do hope that we get to an end to this process as as quickly as possible and we'll see what see what comes out of it it's not it's not easy for any of us in the SNP let me let me be honest and all these people I know well Peter Murrow someone I've known since we were both teenagers together and Nicola is a very a very close and a very dear friend she's made her own statement that she does not believe in any way that she's done anything which is which is wrong or, or could have contravened the law. But let's, you know, let's get to the, the end of the process and we'll take it from there. OK, um, we may get on to the state of the political parties more specifically, but what's the state of our union at the moment? Because certainly since Brexit, there have continued to be divisions, as we know what's happened in Northern Ireland. Mark Drakeford in Wales, the Labour uh, person, has said he feared that we are, meaning Wales, we are under the thumb of a, an English nationalist government, was what he, he said, and he does not. You know, he's not a blusterer, let's put no. it that way. Uh, and Scotland, uh, there remains real unease about coming out of the EU. So what, what's changed and, and how, what is the state of our union? Well, I, I would simply say that it is, it is broken, Gavin. And, I, and if we go back to 2014, um, and I guess not many people would have followed closely what happened after the, the referendum, but we had what was called the Smith Commission, uh, Lord Smith, and all the parties came together. Um, and that was largely on the back of the vow that had been put in place by uh, the Conservative Party, the Labour Party, the Lib Dems, led by the Daily Record newspaper, mm -hmm. to say that as Scotland stayed within the Union, that a couple of things would happen. That um, Scotland would lead the UK, that, uh, that we would have the most important devolved administrations anywhere in the world, as Gordon Brown put it, that we'd get as close to federalism as we, as we could. And actually, if I think about the SNP in, in that 2015 election, we didn't stand on, on a ticket of delivering independence for Scotland. We stood on a, on a ticket of delivering more powers, delivering what was contained within the Smith Commission. So we took that at face value. And I would simply say that we had a, a duty and obligation, and I would stand by that, of respecting the result of that referendum in, in 2014. So we went down on a, on a best efforts basis. But when the, when the Scottish Parliament was established, there was something called the Sewell Convention. And, and the Sewell Convention basically meant that Westminster wouldn't have the ability to legislate in devolved areas, or, or could involve devolved areas, without the consent of the Scottish Parliament, the Welsh Assembly, and so on and so forth. But what happened around Brexit is that that all fell apart. So the first thing that we had... Um, and, and, it, and it happened actually through the, through the Withdrawal Act, was a repatriation of powers back to the UK in areas that were devolved. 
So these powers didn't come back to the, the Scottish Parliament. They were, they were pinched, if I can put it that way, by the Parliament in, in, in London. And you can imagine that we were pretty outraged by that. And this was rammed through Parliament one Tuesday evening. The third reading of that bill was only allocated 15 minutes. And, and I simply wasn't, uh, wasn't allowed to speak. And I think it's fair to say that people in Scotland were really quite alarmed as to what was going on. So that was the first signal that this idea that it was going to be a, a family of nations was simply not going to work. And there wasn't that understanding of the, the position we're in. If I may, I'll tell you a quick story about that, uh, Gavin, because that evening, and it's about 11 o'clock at night, I had uh, three phone calls. One was with Mike Russell, who was the SNP's Brexit secretary. He was in Brussels. He was a relatively mild-mannered man, but he was ready to man the barricades that evening. Um, I did have a conversation with Nicola, and Nicola's advice to me was that I had to do something. <laughs> And uh, my, good advice. my indeed, and, and, and my wife, who's known by two members of the, the audience at least, uh, as a relatively feisty woman, if I, if I may say so, said to me, "If you don't do something, don't come home." And the phone was slammed out. <laughs> so there was there was there was a very there was a very clear instruction as to what I was to do. Um, that was actually the 13th of June. Uh, 2017. Oh. So we've just passed the anniversary. But uh, as a consequence of that, that's the day I got thrown out of Parliament uh, mm -hmm. because I, I stood up for our, our rights at Prime Minister's questions and promptly got thrown out by John Bercow. One of the upshots, there was two upshots of that. One is that my, my parliamentary group didn't know this was happening, but they followed me out. I didn't know they were, that, 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 was, that was going to happen. And we put 10,000 members on that day. Uh, <laughs> so it was <laughs> that in itself um, was quite successful. Anyway, but to come back to the point, what what we would argue is that that the powers of the Parliament have been attacked ever since then, and we've seen two things that have happened. First, we had the uh, the UK Single Market Act, and we've seen that play out now uh, over the deposit return scheme because we want to bring in a deposit. This return is about scheme. Uh, b bottles, bottles being yeah, yeah. And, and Westminster's basically turned around and said, well, you can't include glass. Now, I wish somebody in the UK government could explain to me how you can have a deposit return scheme, but you're going to exclude glass from it. So that's put us in the position that we've had to defer the whole thing. But do, do you see, I mean, we'll pick up that argument in a second, but do, do you see that uh, looking at it, uh, I live in England, I was born in Edinburgh, uh, I brought up there, uh, and I worked in Northern Ireland and actually in Wales quite a bit. Um, do you see that, seen it from many people in England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland have, got, have had a good deal. They've got uh, de devolved parliaments. Uh, England is, some people say, it's the most centralised big country in Europe. Uh, there is, fortunately, in, in my view, I've managed to talk to both Andy Street and Andy Burnham in, uh, in Manchester, and there's a bit of more devolution happening. But England is very centralised. People feel there is a sense of democratic deficit there. So you're talking about the dem democratic deficit in Scotland or things being taken away. But lots of people throughout these islands have got reasons to be somewhat resentful about what happens in Westminster. I, I, I understand that. And, I mean, in, in a sense, you're going back to that, that federalist argument, mm. uh, if, if I may put it that way, Gavin. And I'm, I would encourage people in other parts of England, if that's the road that they want to go down, if that is the best way of dealing with the democratic deficit for them, then of course they should be encouraged and they should be a, a, a allowed to do that. But, and and I'll, I'll come back on that and expand that, but one, one of the things that I must say as well is that contained within the Scotland Act is the power that the Secretary of State for Scotland has to strike down any piece of legislation of the, of the Scottish Parliament. Now, that's never been enacted, never been used until over the course of the last few months. Mm. Now, there was, admittedly, a piece of legislation that has, that has been controversial in terms of uh, the gender uh, recognition certificates. But just to put this in context for everybody, that piece of legislation was a manifesto commitment of the Scottish National Party, of the Labour Party, of the Liberal Democrats, of the Greens. And when the legislation was passed in the Scottish Parliament, it was passed by the, a, a two-thirds majority, with actually Conservative members of Parliament also voting for that. So if you just think about that, that mm. whole respect agenda, when the Secretary of State representing a party that's largely been rejected at the polls consistently since 1955 
has that executive power to say, well, we're not having it, uh, so, uh, and, we're, so, and we're striking that act down? That's an extraordinary way for Westminster to behave so to any development. Just to be clear, you're, we're, not, we're not discussing the... the whatever's in the act no, we're discussing the, the democratic principle, the principle in a country yeah. which could because i think i'm right in saying every one of the 32 electoral districts in scotland voted to remain yeah. and there are no major councils in scotland run by the conservatives is that right there are very few the, there are times when you've been in administration with with with, 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 that with a, well, other people but not but, but, but i mean there are minor, there, there are they are not uh, the first thought of most Scottish no, voters. But I suppose when you think about the 32 local authorities, and let's bring this back to Brexit, every single local authority area in Scotland voted to remain. So it wasn't as if there was a split vote around the country. It was a unanimous situation, really, right across every individual area, that people wanted to stay in the European Union. Now, the situation in the island of Ireland is very different from Scotland, and I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I, I have a, a, a sense of respect that the, the Irish, Northern Irish, have, re, have retained access to the, the single market customs union in effect. But one of the things we argued through Brexit, OK, if people in the rest of the UK have voted to leave the European Union, they're entitled to do that. But there's a way that Westminster could have respected our wishes. Doing the deal they've done over Northern Ireland, they could have left Scotland with access to the, the single market customs union. That was what we talked about was our compromise position, well understood by the, the European Union, by the way, well understood by Michelle Barnier, because I, myself and other colleagues had meetings on them, but it was that intransigence that, that Westminster knows best and you'll do, you'll do as we tell you to do. I, I think people will understand that, uh, and particularly people outside London or across yeah. England uh, yeah. often understand that. But let, let me pick up that point, because I think that's really interesting. Um, I can see exactly why, I mean, I, I, I've argued with people in Westminster that if Scotland and Wales had the same deal as Northern Ireland, there would be much less of a problem. Yeah. Uh, but, in fact, if England had the same deal as Northern Ireland, there'd be much less of a problem. Well, but indeed. That's, that, that, indeed. that indeed. may be a more controversial yeah. point. Yeah. But, but, but you can see you're, uh, that raises the biggest question of all, which is, with an independence agenda, yeah. as the SNP does, there will be a border on this island, the main island from... Uh, you know, John O'Groats to Land's End. And given the mess that has been made of the border in Northern Ireland, where people on both sides of the border have voted for peace yeah. in a, a referendum, it, it may not be very encouraging to think of, a, uh, of an SNP victory or, a, or a, a victory for independence if that border, the border that's very important to us all, yeah. uh, were unmanageable or difficult. So what would, what would you... What would, Project into the future an independent Scotland. What could yeah. that look like but positively? Of course, I mean, I know we haven't reached the end of the journey yet for, for Northern Ireland, and I think we all hope and pray that we do get to a solution that respects mm -hmm. the Good Friday Agreement, that respects the access of Ireland to the Single Market Customs Union, but also leads to, to trade and, and uh, what's the word I'm looking for, but, but trade between the UK and the rest mm -hmm. of the UK and Northern Ireland the way that it, that it should work. And I think... Where there's a goodwill to do that, Gavin, it can happen. And, and the fact that some of the actors have moved on makes it more likely that we, that we can get to that. So, look, in principle, you're right. If Scotland becomes independent and you had an intransigent UK government that said you're having a, you're having a hard border, um, I would regret that to be the case. But it, it need not necessarily follow that that has to happen. Yeah, because, um, the, 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 sorry to interrupt, but the good point about Northern Ireland as somebody who, who lived, lived there for a long time was that the border existed for those who needed it. Correct. And for those who didn't need it, which was another section of the population, it was just a squiggly line and it didn't actually interfere with anything. Absolutely not. So uh, do you think that would be possible in the, in the future of if and if Scotland were to become independent? Yes, it would be possible if there was goodwill, but I understand the practicalities of the challenges of that because there's the aspiration that we have that if Scotland becomes independent then we wish to accede to the European Union as a member and of course as a consequence of that then we'd be in the single market in the customs union. So there'd be practicalities that would have to be negotiated. You can use technology to deal with some of these trade issues if you if you so wish. Let, let me give you an example. I mean I, I spent this morning with the, the Scottish salmon industry and there's very considerable exports of Scottish seafood. And perhaps not well publicised, but there's a deal that's been done through DFDS that Scottish seafood is not checked um, before it reaches 
uh, Bologna, I think it is, um, and is that effectively checked? So where there's a you know where there's a willingness to do these things, you can find solutions, but you need to bring that desire to want to do that in order for these things to work. And it's really important that that has happened when you think about the shelf life of, of fresh product and the providence of that fresh product getting to, getting to supermarkets in France. So when there's a will, politics is about achieving results, Gavin, isn't it? You and I would, uh, would agree with that. Well, I think it's about it's, solving problems rather than creating them, which is, well, which is so why the ways, I'm... The ways that you can do this. Yeah. You know, one, one of the things I would say to you, though, for me as well, is that I regret that over most of the, the last few years... The debate has been about the process of mm -hmm. Scottish independence. It's been about how a referendum would take place. And again, I understand the, the importance of that. But I would far rather we were having a discussion about what kind of country Scotland can become with independence. How do we grow the economy? How do we, do we deliver on the aspirations to get to net zero by 2045? How do we deliver a more entrepreneurial economy, but one that's fairer? Because that's the kind of thing that I think will excite people in, in Scotland. And, I, and I, I want to be respectful to those on the other side of the debate, that we have the discussions on these matters in an informed, an informed manner. And that's largely been missing over the course of the, the last few years. What, what, what do you think it might look like from this side of the, of, of the border? I mean, you said it, it depends upon people wishing to solve problems, essentially, uh, uh, goodwill, and it is possible, and you, you know, your salmon industry uh, reference was obviously very apt there. But what would it mean for people in England? Because one of the things I've sometimes said in public meetings is we forget that our country, the United Kingdom, in uh, the 1920s lost more of its land than Germany did in the Treaty of Versailles. And uh, quite often audiences are completely puzzled by that. But the secession of 26 counties of Ireland was 22% of the land mass of the United Kingdom. Now, we haven't made a real success of uh, relationships with Ireland or we've got much, much better in the last 20 or 30 years. So what, what, what do you think it might look like for the people in England yes. were Scotland to become independent? I think, I think that's an important question. And yeah, we, we've all grown up, a lot of us have grown up watching the troubles in, in, in Northern Ireland and thank goodness we've had relative peace since the Good Friday Agreement and all those that were responsible for mm -hmm. delivering that are, are due our grateful thanks. Yes. And one of the things I suppose when you consider what the Good Friday Agreement meant, it led to the establishment of the British Irish Council and that's a very important uh, vehicle. Um, the British Irish Council is a, is, is a forum where the governments of, of Dublin, of London, but Edinburgh, Belfast, Cardiff, Guernsey, Jersey, Isle of Man come together. So the framework already exists for cooperation to develop across uh, these different nations and territories. And I suppose, I, I mean, I would argue, Gavin, that what we've got now with Ireland, and the relationship between Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom, it's one of mutual respect. And you look at the way that Ireland behaves uh, in the European Union, in the United Nations, the responsibilities that it has as a, as a force for good, being represented and even having chaired the UN Security Council, it shows you that there's a responsibility that small countries can aspire to, but acting in a collegiate way, in a responsible way, and cooperating with other people. And I think what would happen when Scotland becomes independent, as I believe it will, that Scotland will be England's closest friend um, and that the possibility for partnership and friendship will actually be enhanced in many respects because that clash that we, that we have with the, the Parliament in Westminster, that is removed. Uh, so you're much more of an equal when, when these things take place. Um, just a, a final thought on that point. Uh, I know GDP per capita is a difficult question here, but just to put it bluntly, in 1973, when the United Kingdom and Ireland both joined the EU, Ireland's GDP per capita is about two-thirds of the UK. Now it's higher. There's all kinds of measurements. It's higher. In other words, Ireland is a small but much richer country than it used to be, uh, and it has done very well as a country of five million. So is that your model, or is that one of your models? Um, well, yes, it is. And, I mean, I'm, I'm going to give you another statistic in, in relation to that, if I may, and that is, I think in 19... 48, something like 90% of Irish exports were to the United Kingdom. It's now less than 10%. Mm. But actually, in every single year since 1948, Irish exports to the UK increased. 
So there's been a long tail of, of, of Ireland developing its economy. It really developed strongly through from the, from the 1970s. There's an economist uh, based in The Hague by the name of David Skilling. He used to do a lot of work for the New Zealand government, and I would argue that David is probably the leading expert in small countries around the world. Um, and there is some academic analysis of, of all of this as well. And when, when you look at small countries, and it's true whether you look at Europe, whether you look at the Americas, whether you look at Asia, that as a, and I'm making a generalisation, that small countries tend to perform better than, than larger countries. These things don't happen by themselves. You have to make sure that you have a, a unique selling point that you, can, that you can exploit. And this comes back to the, why I want to have the economic discussion about how we could grow the Scottish economy, because it's where you would take that economy over a 5, 10, 15 year view. Um, you've got to show that, you can, that you, can, you can deliver that economic success. But interestingly, in some of David's work, and, and I think back to a report that was written by Credit Suisse in 2014, making the argument that maybe surprisingly there aren't any economies of scale for large countries. Mm. So that large countries actually find it difficult to to move quickly, and, and again, there can be there can be exceptions to that, but these are these are generalisations. Uh, let me let me put some uh, some of the negative points about independence and so on. Uh, put a very blunt political point: the SNP has got the problems that we talked about that we nodded towards. I asked two conservative, prominent conservatives in Scotland, what would prevent independence in Scotland, and they both said a Labour government. Are they right? No, I, 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 you know, I don't believe so. And one of the things, one of the things I would say today, Gavin, and, and, and I, I contrast at the time that you and I would have grown up in Scotland, that politics has become more polarised. And you've, you've got a, in broad terms, let's say you've got sort of 40% plus of the population are committed to, to independence. You've probably got roughly the same that's committed to the union. The argument of Scotland becoming an independent country will be one on those that are undecided. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and my message, whether it would be to Rishi Sunak or Keir Starmer or anybody else, is to respect democracy. Uh, because one way or the other, in the end, if people in Scotland are calling for independence, no Prime Minister can stand in the, in the face of that. And let's not, let's not forget that in 2021, ourselves and the Greens went to the electorate on the premise that if we were elected as a majority government with a majority of MSPs, on a mandate for an independence referendum, that that should happen. So we're in the situation at the moment that Westminster is saying, well, you, we have that as a reserve power and we're not granting you the authority to, to have a referendum. The legal route, because that was tested through the Supreme Court, has shown as not to be open to us. So we're in this very, I would say, challenging situation, regardless of what party was in power, that the electorate of Scotland are sending people to the Scottish Parliament on the basis they're expecting them to deliver an independence referendum. Now, I don't think that pressure is going to dissipate. In fact, I think if we can actually demonstrate that we've got the economic arguments, that we provide the leadership, and I think crucially that the Scottish Government has got to, to show that it can deliver on the devolved agenda. And there's some work to be done. I'm not denying that for one minute. But if we can show that we are a, can be a competent government, that we show the appropriate leadership, and that we've got that manifesto that shows that an independent Scotland could be a wealthier, fairer, greater country. I'm going to give you another statistic and then I'll, I'll stop. There's, there's a book that was written by an academic at Aberdeen University called Anderson. It's called Scotland's Populations. I don't know why it's populations rather than population, but be that as it may. And there's a really quite a, a stark table in that book that shows that Scotland's relative population within the United Kingdom has declined every decade mm -hmm. since 1850. Now, yeah. that's, that's history. It's happened. Yeah. I don't want that history to continue to repeat itself. And but, I would suggest that it's that relative economic opportunity has been a large part of that. And that's the bit you have to change. Isn't there a bit of a nightmare scenario, though, which is that you do win there. You do win a, re a referendum. You get it. And you win it by 20,000 votes or 1% no, or two, yeah. you know, the 52, 48%, because you will have people who say it's, it's not necessarily the settled will, you know, people have changed, many people have changed their minds about Brexit and so on. And it would be difficult. And you would have to not just make the case to the 48% or whatever, 
but you'd have to make it work for them, and that could be very difficult. There'd be, there'd be, tr there'd be trouble, is what I would worry about in that circumstance. I think the point you're making, Gavin, about you need to make it work for them is really, really important. And this is where I would say there's a vast difference from what we faced in the UK with the, the Brexit referendum in 20, 2016. And I think there was a difference in Scotland in 2014 because we tried to make this about the population as, as a whole. It didn't have the divisiveness that we, that we had over, over Brexit, certainly not where I was in the, in the Highlands and Islands. And the point I made earlier about respecting those on the other side, and I'm not saying that we've got all the answers. And in, in the end, if we win, and I hope we win well, but we have got to have that generosity of spirit of taking that other side with us. You know, I suppose, I mean, you and I grew up in Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. And I can understand to an extent, for some people, that, that there's historically been a bit of a reticence about independence. If you think about people in Edinburgh, people working in the financial community, as an example, relatively comfortable, kids going to good school, they're comfortable. And you come along with the proposition that you want to change all of that, mm -hmm. that you want Scotland to be an independent country. In essence, what you have to do is you have to inspire them that what Scotland can become. And, and yes, I think we've got to say that the UK in itself is in relative decline. You can stay with what you've got, and, but you need to give them the self-confidence that you can do something remarkably different. You know, you know, one of the things about where we are today, we, we never really benefited to the extent we should have done from North Sea Oil. We certainly haven't benefited from the first wave of green energy. There is a massive increase in, in green energy production coming over the course of the, the next few decades. Skilling did a report for me last year. Uh, that time we were producing about 12 gigawatts of green energy. Uh, we can go to 80 by 2050, so a five-fold increase. If you really wanted to be ambitious, we could go beyond that. And there's a real challenge to us, there's a real challenge to my government to make sure that we can get the supply chain to work for us. And that's not a given, by the way. Uh, we need to make sure we get the consenting right, the, the, the planning process is right, and all the rest of it. But if we take the opportunity of that and then use that to power our economy, then we'll be in a very different place. But we have to inspire people that we've got the capability of, 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 of doing that. Let's, uh, uh, we've got some roving mics. Would anybody like to ask some questions? Yes, that's, uh, that's great. There's a gentleman at the back, a lady at the front, a gentleman there. So, uh, and then we can have this lady at the front. Yes, go ahead. Hi there. Um, you talked about uh, um, uh, having the same deal as Northern Ireland. Well, um, that was an option, and I was very surprised to see shortly after uh, the referendum, uh, the Brexit referendum, that even Nicola Sturgeon was, uh, she came out with her plan uh, recommending EEA after, and I thought that would have been a, a brilliant third way. Um, but when you had um, uh, Theresa May all boxed in, she had nowhere to, to go. She had to put those different options in the indicative votes. You and the SNP comprehensively voted against any EEA single market option. Uh, and you talk about respecting referendums, but everything the SNP did was to move that towards cancelling um, Article 50 and not looking for any more compromise. So isn't there some belligerence, hostility and hypocrisy on your part? I, I, ho I hope not. Um, look, I, 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 mean, I led the SNP group through that period and one of the things that we warned the UK government of was triggering Article 50 without knowing whether it was trying to take the negotiations because immediately that you triggered that process you were, you, were, you were running against a ticking, ticking clock. Now, we, we argued consistently that we, the compromise position should have been staying in the single market and the customs union. We, we, we produced... I didn't, no, we never, we never voted against the, the single... The, I think, well, with respect, I think what you're referring to is a vote that took place on the customs union. But what we, what, we, what, we, what, we, what we argued consistently, that we needed a proposition of staying in the single market and the customs union. If, if I may, um, we used to have regular meetings of the opposition parties, excluding Labour, ourselves, the Liberal Democrats, uh, the Greens, Plaid Cymru, and, and I argued quite consistently that we needed to try and get a consensus around that option. But one of the things that happened over that period is that the... The Remain vote began to splinter to some extent 
and we ended up with the People's Vote proposition. Now, we supported that, but I did feel that that in itself was going to take some of that, that focus away from, from arguing for a single market and, and the customs union. Now, some of the votes that you're talking about, when we had one of the meaningful votes, there was the, the infamous occasion where Theresa May invited all the opposition leaders to her office behind the Speaker's chair. And that was just after Change UK had been formed and Chaka Amuna had turned up as the, as the effective leader. He'll remember this, Gavin, I can see by the look <laughs> in your face. And Jeremy Corbyn um, then refused to go into the room. So the rest of us went in and I was left as the leader of the largest opposition group so I, I sat opposite Theresa May and um, I, I opened up by saying, look, this place is trapped, there, there isn't a way through this, all of us are going to have to compromise, we are willing to go through that process with you and the view that we have, our starting position, is that that compromise position is the single market customs union. I, I spoke for two or three minutes, she looked up at me and said, but Ian... Brexit means Brexit. And, 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 I, and I thought at that point, really, what is the point? It's, I want to bring in the lady yeah. in there. Like, you, Change UK reminds me, I was once asked, was I ever a member of an organised political party? I said, no, but I was in Change UK for about eight weeks. Yeah. Uh, lady there. It's been extremely interesting, especially to hear about the behaviours of the Westminster government towards the Scots. I'm very much English, but I think if I was Scottish, I would have a deal of sympathy. Mm. Can I turn it round and say, how can the Westminster, or if we can call it pseudo-English Parliament, change in its behaviours, its respect, and the way it actually treats the various different countries of the United Kingdom to make you think we're better staying together? Good question. Well, that, that, that is a good question. And and, of course, there are points of difference. And for me, it's about having the economic powers of being able to, to build the, 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 the Scottish economy. We have very significant points of difference. We're in a very fine academic institute here in, in York this evening, but we have a very different approach to universities, tuition fees and so on. We're wholly against tuition fees. A lot of our approach to, to social security is very, very different. I think our, our values in that sense, I'm not talking about the values of the people, but the, the values of the, the administration are, are very different from the values that we see in Westminster. Having said that, I, I as an individual and, and the, the government that I de facto represent in Scotland would far rather that the two governments could, could work together. I, I think that's what people would expect to see. And, and I hope that that is the case with the, the new Prime Minister that we have, although the, the experience so far is not a good one, having a look at what's happened with DRS, looking at what's happened with uh, the Section 35 triggering and so on and so forth. So I think it would be in everybody's interest in areas where practically that we can work together that we do that, because in the end that we all benefit from that. <coughs> but we respect the rights of each Parliament <coughs> to legislate in its own areas of, of domestic competency. A uh, gentleman there in the black shirt. Yeah, get that. Given that the referendum... Oh, we'll get, let, get a microphone to you, sir. Yeah. Given that the referendum has been blocked as the path to independence, what in practical terms is the path? Mm. Yeah, that's... I mean, that's a very, a very good question. And, and for those that are firm believers in, in independence, a lot of them look at parliamentarians and they say, what are you doing about this? We give you a mandate, but you're not able to trigger that referendum. And I can understand the frustration. However, what I, what, I, what I would say to you, sir, is that if you look at polling over the course of the last couple of years, that support for independence has been in a relatively narrow band. It's been in the, in the high 40s to the, the low mid 50s. We really need to demonstrate, as the phrase that Gavin used, that it's the settled will of the Scottish people that they want independence to take place. We have to, if I may say so, be in the position that it becomes almost impossible for Westminster mm -hmm. to argue against that because you're then arguing against democracy and the right of people to, to choose their own future. But so that comes back to having that, that debate about what kind of country, the economy that you can, you can create and all the rest of it. And I am absolutely convinced that if we go with these arguments, and we've got to look on the basis that there isn't a, a route 
for a referendum that the Scottish Parliament can call, because that's been blocked by the Supreme Court, as I'm not criticising them because they're interpreting the, the Scotland Act, then we have to use the ballot box at an election. And, of course, Hamza Youssef, as the, as the new First Minister, he has to determine exactly what the tactics will be for the, the next Westminster election. But any election has to be the opportunity for the people of Scotland to put their cross on a ballot paper and say that they're expressing a desire that Scotland should be an independent country. So many, some more questions? Anyone from the side? Yes, a lady down the front here. And a gentleman there too. So maybe the lady and then the gentleman. Hello, thank you. I'm just thinking about what the demographics of independence are in Scotland. Is there more interest from young people? And how do you see the future, you know, with the new generations coming through? Is that good or not so good? Yeah, well, again, that's, that's a good question. There is a, there's a lot of academic uh, analysis of what happened in 2014, and indeed you can get the breakdown in a number of the polls that we've seen in the period since then. And it is the case that the, the younger that you are, then the more likely that you, that you are to support uh, in, independence. So support for independence has, has tailed off once you get to people of, uh, frankly, of my generation and, 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 and above. Um, I think in, in, in all these areas you've seen, you've seen a shift over, over, over recent years. We need to win the hearts and minds of every different demographic if we're to, if we're to win this. Uh, can, can I just uh, add one other point? Uh, I was amazed at the 16 and 17 year olds I talked to because the, the, the yeah. vote was extended to 16, 17 yeah, year olds. Yeah. And I have to say, well, uh, this is during the independence campaign. I thought, oh, this is a mistake. What, uh, I was so utterly wrong. I found that the 16 and 17 year olds were really clued up. Whatever their views were, they were really clued up. And uh, so, there we are. It's, Gavin, can I just say, I think it's really, really important that you, that you said that. We had a Yes shop in Sky in the main, I don't know how many people have been to Sky, been to Portree. We've got a, we had a Yes shop in the main street in Portree. And the high school was just around the corner from it. And it's just exactly as you said. Young people were coming in every day. Yes, supporters, no supporters, but mm -hmm. by goodness, they were well informed. Yeah. And it was just, you know, it was a joy to see the participation that we, that we had from our, our young people because it, it was their future. And I, I bitterly regret that two cohorts were not given a vote in the EU referendum, EU nationals and 16 and 17 year olds. What a disgrace that those that were going to be most affected, their futures most affected, were not given that right. And I'm absolutely convinced that we did the right thing extending that franchise to 16 and 17 year olds. Gentlemen up there, yes, sir. Thank you. Um, it's interesting you, you made the point there about EU nationals. I'm a Welshman living in England and apart from on International Saturdays I think of myself as sort of British, I think. I would feel disenfranchised if Scottish independence, which effectively is the breakup of the United Kingdom, is delivered purely on the will of the Scottish people. If, if you're going to have that referendum, have it for the UK and see where that leads us in terms of democracy. Well, well thank you. But look, let, let, me, let me take the point about Britishness because I think one of the strengths of the, of the Good Friday agree, Agreement is it allows people in the north of Ireland to characterise themselves as, as British or Northern Irish or Irish people, you remove that friction that comes back to the issue of, of border that you raised, Gavin. I'm perfectly happy with people in Scotland or anywhere else defining themselves as British. Why would, why would I have any concern about that? We, we live in the British Isles. And that social union that has bound us together will continue to exist if the political union comes to an end. It's about living together at peace and harmony and respecting the different traditions respecting those that don't agree with me on, on the issue of independence of statehood for Scotland. So I think there are ways that we can approach this, that we can, we can do this in the, in the right manner. I understand the point you're making about people in the rest of the UK having a say, but, but fundamentally this is about the right of those in Scotland to choose to, to go their own way. Nobody suggested with Brexit that people in the rest of Europe should have had a say as to whether or not the UK had the, had the right to accede. They might have voted get them out. <laughs> they might have done, Gavin, who knows. Uh, um, I'll, I'll come to you in a second, sir. Just, uh, uh, just, can I just ask the audience one, que one question? How, are you satisfied that the system of governance that affects England 
is actually working quite well for you now. So if I said, because I've said to audiences in the past the dreaded C word, constitution, would, it, do you think there may be things about the way we actually run things that would affect England that you'd like to see changed? I'm not asking you in certain ways. Could you just put up your hand if you think we need to change the way we, we actually run things? Thank you, for, thank you very much. Can I, can I very, very, very briefly, yeah. for, I mean, again, for those that might not be aware, the Scottish Parliament is elected in a very different way mm. from the the Westminster Parliament. So we have two votes. You have the constituency vote just as we have here, but we also have a list system. So we have 73 members of the Scottish Parliament elected first past the post, and we have 56 list members done on a regional basis. Now we do rather well on, on the constituency side. We have 61 of the, of the 73 seats, but the list system equalises uh, the votes of those that are not represented by the first past the post system. So it's inherently fairer in that sense. It means that every vote does count. I will say, I think, for those that came up with that system based on the De Haunt model, it was done in a way as to stop the SNP ever getting a majority. <laughs> so I acknowledge that. Although we broke the system in, in 2011 because we did deliver a majority. The best laid schemes. Um, yeah. Yes, sir, the gentleman there, and then there's a lady over there and a yeah. gentleman there. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's lovely to see you in person as well as admiring your performance on uh, uh, PMQs. <laughs> but, uh, uh, no, my question is, one of the great disasters about the Brexit vote was people were only voting on their personal agenda and an awful lot of people were voting for one particular thing and not taking the whole thing into, into account. And an awful lot of people were voting against something. And you can easily see that people in Scotland would be voting against uh, the Tory government, uh, against uh, other people as well. How do you make sure that people are actually voting for something and not some, something yeah. ephemeral that uh, has been, been promised, like the, you know, the, 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 the bus and such yeah. like? Because that's, that's where the division has come from, isn't it? Because uh, no, everyone is, more people are disappointed than are pleased. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. And you're, you're, you're absolutely right, the slogan on the side of a bus, goodness gracious. Um, you know, one of the things we did in 2014 is we had a white paper. Um, Gavin, you might remember how many pages there were to that. There were hundreds. Uh, 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 yes. I can't remember exactly how many hundreds there were. Can you... Can, 600? Was it 600? Uh, yeah, I didn't read it all. I can't but I got, I got yeah, but, the but, but, yeah, and it, so, so it went into an awful lot of detail. I mean, we, and, you know, to, to be blunt, we allowed ourselves to be shot at because we said, right, here it is. Here is the, the prospectus as how, how we see an independent Scotland. And I think we... We owe it to people to be able to go through all of these things, to answer the questions that, that, that you put about borders and so on. Um, so make sure that you make this information available to people, but have that debate with those on, on the other side. I mean, I've said to people in the Conservative and Labour Party, when we have the, the referendum, as I believe will happen, let's go out and let's do this together. Let's have these meetings. Mm. Let's respect each other's views and let's have that honest debate. Uh, we did it in Sky. Um, we, we had 70-odd public meetings, um, just about every township. And I don't know, Gavin, if, if, if you know Roger Hutchison, who's a no. journalist that's based in Razi, been around a, a long time. And I was going over to do a public meeting there with Arthur Cormack, who's mm. a well-known Gaelic uh, figure. And um, I'd spoken to Roger, and, and Roger said to me, he said, um, you know, I'm a no-voter. I said, of course I know you're a no-voter. I said, how would you feel about me chairing your meeting and that we, the three of us do it together? I said, you know what, Roger, I think that's a really good idea. 80% of the island of Rassi came to that public meeting. Yes. And yeah. it was a joyous occasion because you were able to have that balanced discussion as to, as to what the options were. But you're making a very good point about referendum, both, both of you, because uh, you know, the referendum in Northern Ireland was based on a document which I think was about 35 pages long. Every yeah. household got, got it. Copy, yeah. So you were absolutely clear what you were voting for or against. We had 16 words in the Brexit referendum. Uh, that wasn't quite the detail of either your document or the, no. the Northern Ireland one, which everybody could understand. Yeah. Yes, there was, uh, uh, yeah, and there was a lady there yeah. too, in the orange, I think. Come to you. Surely the position um, that we find ourselves in currently with lockdown parties, um, Boris Johnson, Liz Truss, general misrule of the Conservative government, not to mention Brexit, is quite 
ideal for the SNP in terms of recruiting more supporters. So why do you think that support for independence hasn't shot up dramatically? You know, I, I've always made the point that Scotland won't become independent because we, we have misrule from Westminster, if you want to characterise it that way. If people are going to vote for independence, it's because of the self-confidence they have as to what Scotland can achieve. And that's the discussion that we, that we really need to have. People often used to say to me, why do you want rid of Boris Johnson? Well, I wanted rid of Boris Johnson because he's never been Prime Minister in the first case. Um, for all the personality traits of the, 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 the lying, the misleading of Parliament that we now know about, and I could go on about many, many of his other attributes. So I wanted him out the way. But, but the duty, the obligation I have is to spell out how Scotland can do better. And that's the way that Scotland will become independent. Is, it, it, is the federal idea dead? I mean, I, when I looked at, I didn't look at all those, the words that were written before, but to put it briefly, uh, in 2014, uh, an independent Scotland would accept uh, Her Majesty the Queen as head of state, so presumably mm -hmm. the King, uh, would accept the pound and the Bank of England. So it was a, a very codependent inter independence, was it not, with those, those, those things happening? It wasn't, it wasn't a complete break and therefore a federal agenda presumably where a an incoming Labour government who wanted to do things for Yorkshire, wanted to do things for, for, for English cities that feel they should have mayors and so on, might see Scotland as part of that and that might be sweet enough to diminish your vote significantly. I think you've got in, in some senses you've got a twin track approach because for us, I think Scotland has to become independent, but that, that process towards federalism in England, and there are some prominent academics that have uh, discussed this over, over a long period of time, some, some real experts that you have close to hand, <laughs> if I may say so, in, this, in, this, <laughs> in this particular area. And I think it's perfectly legitimate to have, to have that conversation, Gavin. But our interests, our aspiration, are about Scotland becoming an independent country, but you've rightly raised the issue, the issue of the, the Union of the Crowns, of pulling sovereignty on, on, on currency and therefore uh, on monetary policy to some extent as well. So let me kind of go through those. It's the act of union that we're seeking to, to end, not the union of the, the Crowns. And right. um, I, I think what you saw, uh, particularly with the sad passing of the Queen, is the respectful way that, 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 that Scotland mourned uh, the, the, the passing of the monarch. Now, look, people are entitled to make their own judgments in the, in the future as to whether or not uh, they wish to see the continuance of monarchy, but it's the established position of the SNP that the, the monarch would remain head of state in, a, in an independent Scotland. You know, when it comes to currency, I mean, I, you know, I, I would argue that in, in the end, what, what are you seeking to do? You're seeking to to make people's lives better. Uh, I want to make sure that we can deliver the jobs, that we can drive the investment. And politics is about the art of the possible, isn't it? And, and for me, to accept that, that I will pool sovereignty, if you want to express it like that, and retain the pound until as such times that we've gained the right to be able to have our own currency, then why wouldn't I Or do the that? euro, possibly. Well. There would be a legitimate argument for people to, to, to put. That's not the SNP's <laughs> position today, but there's a legitimate argument for, for people to, to put. But for us, you know, we can, we can deliver the jobs. We can drive up wealth creation. We can deliver that greener economy. We can deliver a fairer country. And I don't necessarily need currency in order to do that. So I'm prepared to to make compromises in order to deliver the things that I, that I can do. I think we've got time for one more question, a uh, gentleman there. Thank you, and thank you for a fascinating evening. Um, given that the decision went against you last time, which of your arguments would you change and how? I think, you know, put very simply, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that I've kind of said this uh, a couple of times, but it comes down to winning the, that economic argument. And I think it is about giving people self-confidence. I remember in the, the week of the referendum speaking to a young woman that had said to me that she wanted to vote yes, but she was scared. Um, so we need to give people the confidence that we have the roadmap, that we can deliver this, the stronger economy that, that, I've, that I've laid out, that we can drive this investment. 
We need to lead by example. We need to show. We need to show that the Scottish Government can deliver. We can deal with the challenges that we've got in the health service and other areas, for example. So there's a, there's a big job to do, but show people. Show people graphically what you can do. I, I think... Um... I think I remember it was Tony Benn who, who once said that when he left Parliament he was going to get into politics, which I thought was uh, <laughs> uh, get into real politics. I mean, what are you, what are you up to? <laughs> well, that's a question. Well, I'm, I'm getting to the, the latter stages of completing a report, which is commissioned by the, the SNP Westminster Group, but will be delivered to the, to the Scottish Government. And it is on... The document's going to be called Mapping Scotland's Industrial Future. And I've been engaged in this over the course of the, the last five months with two, you know, very, very talented people that I've been blessed to work with. So, uh, Sir Martin Donnelly, who was the permanent secretary at Bayes, then went on to run Boeing in Europe, mm -hmm. really an inspirational character, and Professor Dominic Holder uh, from the London Business School. And so we will, we will produce a report. There's been lots of reports published over the decades from a variety of worthy people, but in the end it's about delivery. And what I've expressed to the First Minister is that we need to help him. Um, and I'll play some kind of part in assisting the, the Scottish Government on its economic agenda. I, uh, I have accepted the role of the, the First Minister's business ambassador, so I'm, I'm looking forward to engaging with people, listening with people, listening to voices, listening to people in the business community, thinking about how we can unleash the potential that we have in our academic community uh, would, be, would be one aspect it, of all is, of that. Isn't that well. a good point? Because one of the things, I mean, some of the newspaper headlines and mm. the TV headlines are so miserable, and then you actually go about this country and think, there, and I'm back to talking about the United Kingdom, but you go about from, from one end of it to the other, it's full of great universities, great seat, seats of learning, uh, we've got so many Nobel Prizes for this and that. Yep. We've got amazingly inventive people. And somehow that potential, and I'm not just talking about Scotland here, but that potential is not entirely being unleashed, is it? You know, if you were to, if you were to start that from scratch, you would say that what you really need is a Scottish Enlightenment. <laughs> um, <laughs> when did that happen before? But, but, so I don't, I don't mean to be flippant, I'm not. But... One of the things I've really enjoyed about the engagement we've had, and that's been with people in Scotland, people in other parts of the United Kingdom as well, that point that we've got some outstandingly talented people, mm -hmm. but we need to make sure that they can, they can use their talents, the, the, the freedom to expose their talents in the right way. But the thing I've been most encouraged with, Gavin, is that every single person, group, company, institution we've met with want to help. Now, I don't mean that in a, in a party political sense, but they want to help because they want the country to be as successful as it, as it can be. And I have to say, that's quite inspiring. So we have to help them to do the job. Let, let me say this, because if there's, if there's, since we're in an academic institution, what are, what are the exam questions? So the exam questions are, what does the Scottish Government have to do to help? Mm -hmm. And what does the Scottish Government have to do to get out of the road? <laughs> These are the two questions. <laughs> Probably get me into trouble. But, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I once, once asked the business person for his top, his top tip for the business, and it was, give us some more money and get out of our way. So uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure it's quite bit, that easy. No, it's, it's, no, it's not. But, uh, Anyway, on that, on that note, I'd like to thank Ian for his wit, his wisdom. Yeah, uh, we'll miss, I personally will miss you in Parliament. Thank I'll you. personally miss you at uh, Prime Minister's Questions. I'd like to thank the audience for being yes, a great audience, you. being engaged and being interested. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you